decline of Jewish proselytism. Jewish proselytism began to decline the second century AD, especially during what sometimes is um, called in technical circles the Sinaitic period, G-A-N-N-A-I-T-I-C, Sinaitic period, the second century AD, and it was due to several factors. We're going to discuss these factors here first of all quickly. Number one, the rabbis held an increasingly bad attitude toward them. We've given you all of this evidence on ITP tape 112, the bad rabbinical attitude, and it began to increase as the years went by. Now, what caused that? Well, that's another matter that we'll get to also with some of these factors that figure in with the decline and finally the end of Jewish proselytism. In other words, the Jewish people are not winning proselytes second century AD like they have in earlier years. And they're not even wanting to. I mean, that's a, it's a twofold factor here. Remember, the rabbis refer to them sometimes as scabs of Judaism. <coughs> All they are is scabs. They've still got the sore underneath, which is um, polytheism, uh, paganism, and heathenism. And all they are is scabs on Judaism. So you can look back in your notes for ITP tape 112, and you'll find the evidence for our first factor. Number two, another factor that figures in, we have to have some way of explaining how or why Jewish proselytism began such a perilous decline. That's persecution. During the time, for instance, here's one for instance of persecution, during the time of the Emperor Hadrian, those years being A.D. 117 through 138. Castration was outlawed. It was outlawed by law, Roman government. You say, well, now what does this have to do with Jewish proselytism or persecution? Well, evidently, <laughs> and we just kind of assume this from circumstantial evidence, uh, evidently, circumcision was looked upon as a minor form of castration. It's not literal castration, but I guess it could be looked upon as a minor form of that <coughs> or a prelude, prelude to it. So you can see what type of situation this would put not only the Jewish people in, but particularly any Gentiles thinking or hoping or wanting to convert over to Judaism. Um, if you want to convert to Judaism, you have to be circumcised. If you're circumcised and that is put in the same boat now under Roman laws as castration, you've broken the law of the Roman government. And not only now do you have all these other factors against you of the um, social uh, stigma and um, uh, familial excommunication and all of this, now you have the government against you because now you have broken a law. So full conversion, you see, by a Gentile, and that's what proselytism is, full conversion to Judaism. Full conversion by a Gentile to Judaism is now no longer possible. You see, because to circumcise is, in the eyes of the Roman government, to break this new law prohibiting castration. So now it's impossible to proselytize, because the only way to proselytize is to get them to go through these three steps. And if the most important one, circumcision, is taken out from underneath you and taken away from you, then, of course, that spells the doom and the decline of proselytism. Then a third factor, last one, <coughs> Christianity. We can sum it up in a word, and then I'll take a little while to explain this. And I think number three now explains number one. Christianity. The rabbis more and more dislike the proselytes of the gate. It started with this, of course. Then because of number two, you have to rule out full proselytes. But they more and more, the rabbis, dislike proselytes of the gate. What's another name that they are known by? Well, the God-fears. More and more dislike the God-fears. By the third century A.D., the rabbis aren't even familiar with the phrase Sibominoi ton theon. And why do you think that the rabbis more and more dislike proselytes of the gate? Because of the 
great inclination of the proselytes of the gate to convert, yes, but not to Judaism, to Christianity. And they were an almost convert to Judaism, and you kind of feel robbed of sheep from the fold then. So you've got to follow with me now in these thoughts. It's not difficult, but you have to make all these connections or you'll get lost in following these thoughts. Therefore, the proselytes of the gate are just ruled out entirely from the Jewish circles. god fears are not allowed in or near Judaism at all because of their tendency to embrace Christianity whenever they are presented with one or the other of these options. You know, whenever they're presented with both of them, you can have one or the other. We see what they have opted for in the past. As I've given you some quotations from other writers before, um, saying something along this line, that the very um, stumbling blocks in Judaism to full conversion by god fear were the exact things that Christianity repudiated, namely circumcision. So as a result of this dislike and an evil attitude expressed by the rabbis of the, shall we say, half proselytes, eventually it filters all the way through to full proselytes so that proselytism itself is in danger. And by some time in the second century, <coughs> let's say middle of the second century, proselytism in its entirety is not only endangered, but it's finally quenched and swept away by the immense success of the Christian gospel. Remember, these are the very people that are most ripe for Christianity because they're, they're willing to believe in one God. They're willing to line their lives up morally and ethically. That's what the Jews <laughs> taught in the synagogues. But this circumcision business, this business of committing oneself to all the oral, legal stipulations of the rabbis, that was another matter for them. And so the one thing that was hindering them from entering into, let's say, the kingdom, quote unquote, was the very thing taken out of the way by the kingdom of God and the spread of Christianity. So here's what happens then. The Jews themselves as a people become more and more cut off. This will explain their later history, you see. They become more and more cut off and isolated from the entire world. Remember, the dispersion was good to begin with because it put the light of God, the truth of God, out into the four corners of the earth. The Jews were spread everywhere with the law and the prophets. It was meant for the good of the world. And the Jews had a lot of interaction with the Gentiles around them because of their desire to proselytize. But if you know anything about Jewish history, if you know anything about, let's say, uh, medieval Jewish history, you know that the Jewish people become more and more isolated from the world around them. It's not true during the New Testament. I mean, we just see them everywhere in the world and the world everywhere with them. And you close the New Testament up and then you open into second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries after that and you see some remarkable, notable changes in Judaism. So I'm just trying to explain something for your benefit in history right now. We'll get to some more practical things here in a moment. The Jews become more and more isolated, cut off from their neighbors in the diaspora because the Gentiles are more attracted to Christianity. This, in turn, we're still under number three, this third factor of Jewish um, proselytizing decline. Uh, this then calls the Jewish people to become greatly dependent on the rabbis which concurrently brought the great rabbinical schools of Judaism to their point of flourishing, which then itself begins the long development stretching right down through the Middle Ages up into almost modern times. In other words, the Jews become inbred and in-schooled after that. No more contact with the world <laughs> for hundreds and hundreds of years. No more contact with the Gentiles. Uh, the rabbinical schools train, and they, they, we had had rabbinical schools before, but there's, there's no interaction, there's no sparring back and forth with the Gentile writers and the Jewish writers. And you find it in the writings of people like Philo and Josephus. They were familiar with the Gentile writers and writings before their time and during their time and around them. As you go centuries after this, no more. And it's because of the immense success of the Christian gospel and its spread. It just conquers the world quote unquote as we have understood it in our past studies it conquers the world and it takes the ripest candidates 
the God fears right out of the hands of Judaism. And so what does Judaism have? Now, you don't have the God fears. Those are stolen by these renegades like Paul and so forth. You don't have the God fears anymore. You don't have full proselytes because the law against castration rules that out. So what do you have? No Gentiles anymore. Proselytism comes to an end in the second century AD. Now, we've been working on this since last April, remember, so this is part of the conclusion right here. We've looked at all of its development and the ins and outs of it, and now I'm telling you it comes to a conclusion here. And I've given you tidbits, hints along the way with these negative attitudes of the rabbis. You should have been thinking, well, what caused them to be negative then? This was the great source of blessing to increase the ranks and swell your numbers by the addition of Gentile converts, but not when people like Paul are running around the world. That doesn't work then. And so we have the development of the rabbinical schools, and Judaism becomes so um, hyperly inbred. And if you know anything about Jewish history, you know that's kind of the story of Jewish history for many, many years after that. Before, in the same time as the rest of the world comes through the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and so forth, um, Jewish scholars like Spinoza and so forth begin to think and come out of that shell. Okay, that's what I want to say about the end and decline, or maybe I should rearrange that, the decline and end of Jewish proselytism. Another statement I want to give, this is from, I'm going to be quoting a lengthy paragraph, you can just kind of listen, it's real interesting, it sums up a lot of what we've said, but a paragraph from the, the revised edition, this isn't the revised edition of the revised Bible of the revised, but this is the revised edition of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, often known as ISPE. Volume 1, out of a projected four volumes, three are available now, pages 967 through 968. And the writer here, it's the very end of their discussion of the dispersion, the diaspora, and I thought it was very interesting uh, because he sums up, the author, in four points, the different perspectives that people could have, depending on who you are, what group you've come from, the different perspectives people could have, therefore the different light that could be shed on the dispersion, on the diaspora. So listen to this and see if this isn't kind of the story that we have been looking at earlier. The dispersion, he writes, has been interpreted in several ways. Number one, as viewed by the Old Testament prophets. Then he'll go by the ancient pagan world, by the Jews themselves, and by the church. So as viewed by the Old Testament prophets, it was a just punishment for Israel's sin. Now, we spent a long time looking at that, that, that for the prophets, that was the meaning of the diaspora, is obedience brings blessing, disobedience brings discipline, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30, other passages in the Old Testament. If you disobey me, I'll scatter you to the four winds of heaven. So there's one perspective, and that's a true perspective. All of these are true. As viewed by the Old Testament prophets, it was a just punishment for Israel's sins. Number two, as viewed by the ancient pagan world, what do they think about it? We've done whole studies on this. It was an occasion for hostility against a non-conforming people. I said if one word sums up the diaspora, it would be the word tension. Tension of having the light of God, of knowing that you're bound to the word of God, and yet living in a secular pagan environment. No longer in Palestine, but out in the world. And of course, you would be a nonconformist. You would not conform to the ways of the world around you. And as a result of that, the people in the world around you would manifest hostility towards you. So as viewed by the ancient pagan world, it was an occasion for hostility against a nonconforming people. Number three, as viewed by the dispersion Jews themselves. So you should know the answer to all of these. As viewed by, well, how did they look at it? It was a testimony to the tenacity of their faith and the durability of their heritage. They were proud of it. They were proud of the cosmopolitan experience that many of them were going through. And number four, as viewed by the church, which has been our study for the last... Uh, few messages now. As viewed by the church, and I think this is the most important thing, uh, surely, in the mind of God, it was the divinely ordained means of providing a beachhead for the spread of the gospel in alien territory. And what was that? That was those, those dots that we call synagogues all over the European map and down into Africa as well. A beachhead 
And where does Paul always go? To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. He got to the synagogue and he preached to the Jews. And meanwhile, he's preaching to the Gentiles there too. Full converts to Judaism and what we might call, this is my own terminology, it's rather um, derogatory, I guess, but synagogue leeches, the god fears. They were good people. I don't mean that in a bad sense. So as viewed by the church, it was the divinely ordained means providing a beachhead for the spread of the gospel in alien territory. Uh, whatever else may be said, he concludes his article, the Jewish dispersion was and is a phenomenon unparalleled in human history. And so how, do we ha how is it that we have scholars and theologians and church members and writers around today who say, well, Jews in history, that doesn't mean anything. It's just purely racial and political. You just, you're not thinking. The Jewish dispersion was and is a phenomenon unparalleled in human history. A people that small, that ancient, that despised, and yet lasting that long. There has to be something from above with, with regard to that. There has to be something spiritual and supernatural about that. Well, last week we looked at, or a couple of weeks ago, we were out of town last week, or I was. I hope you weren't. I think you were probably around here. Maybe some of you were gone, but... And I think we need to mention what we were on to bring us back into uh, what we want to conclude tonight. By the way, tonight's our last study on proselytism and the diaspora. We'll be to a new area, Lord willing, next Friday night. But we were looking at the question, who were Paul's converts? And a lot of people haven't appreciated, well, let me say something else first. A lot of people haven't appreciated the fact of the diaspora in the role of the spread of the early church in the book of Acts. In other words, what I mean by that is somehow they just have this naive notion that whenever the Spirit came down, he empowered the church to just go out and turn the world upside down, and they could win as many converts in as many places any time of the day that they wanted to. And the facts of the matter in the book of Acts, if we believe the word of God, say otherwise. They tell us that Paul didn't make converts just everywhere and with everyone out in the world. There was a specific plan involved. And Paul tells us again and again to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And he shows us what he means by that in Luke's narrative in Acts. You go to the synagogue and you preach to Jew and Gentile, oftentimes at the same place and at the same time. And your converts, for the most part, come from the Gentiles. And so by the end of this first century, the church, its constituency, is primarily Gentile and not Jewish. And it becomes even more so and more pronounced Gentile as time goes on. Now, you tie in our messages two weeks ago and what we're going to say tonight, then what we have here will be four points. You may want to get this down so you can see what we've done and where we're going tonight. Four points. And maybe even better than calling them one, two, three, four, they, they more fit the scale of A, B, A, B. That is, the odd numbers go together and the even ones go together. The odd ones, speaking of the historical truth that we've uncovered in our studies, and the even ones speaking of how that can make application to where we are today. And so number one, or A, if you want to list them like that, they're really A, B, A, B, was a question, who were Paul's converts? We learned who those were. Basically, God fears basically God fears and then you would have to go a little further than that and kind of explain well what have you just said well there are some things you've said and haven't said you haven't said that Paul makes his converts just from raw paganism you have said that Paul does make his converts for the most part from among the Gentiles but he makes it from the midst of a group of people who have had some contact a good contact with true religion. And what you haven't said, again, on the other hand, is that Paul made his converts from among that group of people who were staunch, indoctrinated into their beliefs, such as the proselytes, number one, and the Jews, number two, behind that. People who were staunch in their beliefs. And then B, or number two, however you want to look at it, this is all two weeks ago, we would make application of that today. That's why I say you could list it A, B, A, B. <coughs> this was the historical truth. This will be tonight the historical truth. Here's the application for today. Here's the application for today. 
or one, two, three, four. And what was the application? Well, the application was uh, many fold. I can kind of sum it up in a few statements and thoughts here. The church of our day has misinterpreted the biblical mandate of the Great Commission or the church's call to missionary activity. Amen. Thinking they, they think, and I'm telling you, this is probably all of your attitudes before you either came to this church or before you saw it in this study right here, is when I, when I pick up Acts, I just, I thought, this is what I thought I was saying, that Paul, because I, I'm seeing these geographical names over and over and over again all over Europe, you know, that Paul went all over the world and, quote, turned the world upside down for Jesus, unquote. I mean, he went to pagans. He just won people everywhere. Now, a closer study of Acts disproves that theory. That is purely a man-made theory. And so we don't want to go back into all of that. That's on two tapes earlier. It took us that long to discuss it then. But that's an important thing to remember. And here's the application. It, it really does apply. And the church needs to know this, but they don't know it. They're spending millions of dollars in years overseas fruitlessly. No fruit produced. Maybe a couple of converts dubious at that, and they're proud at that if they can make a couple of converts. We shouldn't be surprised. How can you come from America going to a savage land and get people, I mean, really convinced? If, if, if nothing else, what they'll see is what they saw with Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14. They'll think that the Jesus you're talking about is just a new one of their many, many gods, just a new one they haven't heard about yet. Oh, so we'll now worship him with all of our voodoo and witchcraft and magic. And you see that happening over and over and over again. We've never studied, you know, in detail here, a class on missiology, a study of missions. But I know about that. I have studied it. You'd be surprised. The, the results just are not there. Results as far as numbers are concerned. And those aren't the most important results. But after all, why go if you're not going to get any converts? I mean, it would be a waste of time over there. The facts of the matter tell us that missionaries from this country, from English-speaking countries of the Western world, have gone and, quote, won people to Jesus, unquote, but won them with all of their superstitions and their magic and their witchcraft and their voodoo. And yet they go ahead and worship God. And they just bring all of their superstition and all of their abominable occult sins right into Christianity. Well, you're not truly born again. You know, they, they're mixed up in their mind. So the church needs to restudy the word, I think, and readjust its missionary schedule. And then as far as that applies to us, we would still be on number two or the first B here, is for the most part, and again, we, we said we digressed several times two weeks ago to make sure no one misunderstood what I was saying, that God can reach anybody. He can reach anybody anywhere. We're not trying to limit God. We're just trying to see how the early church carried out the Great Commission. But for the most part, God seems to be able, or he seems to, let's say it that way. That's just the fact of the matter, not speaking of his ability or his lack of ability. But God seems to reach the people who have some knowledge, something to do with true religion. I mean, even if you came out of a denominational background, as I said then, you knew the words, you knew the motions, you knew the books of the Bible and so forth. Now, we know there are exceptions. We know there are some of you in this church that are exceptions to that. But exceptions only prove the rule, though. By the way, I'm probably further along than you are if you came out of one of those non-religious backgrounds. I think I've proven that many, many times over the years. So you just have to, that means you've got to work twice as hard, I guess. You've got to go back and learn about David and Goliath and make sure you don't guess that those were two of the Lord's first apostles. <laughs> you remember that recent joke that I told you? Or that first, second, third John were triplets or anything, any nonsense like that. I mean, those, those questions, that, that's not just me thinking that. Those questions have been asked on Bible surveys, and they get those answers. They say, what's Noah's wife? Joan of Ark. They really mean that. They think that. That's Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. It makes a lot of sense. Joan of Arc, she's a famous person. Uh, you're only probably, you know, how many uh, millennia on the wrong side of the issue? <laughs> oh, my, my, my. But um, you've heard the typical jokes that people have to look in their index to find Genesis, or if you say turn to Hezekiah, they'll actually literally look for it in their Bible and all of that nonsense. So... Those people are just uneducated, and you try to teach them the truth then, and you've got to start, you know, at square one. That's no problem. Maybe that's the best place to start anyway, but 
surely and certainly with these people, you've got to start at square one. Tell them what the terms are, what the arguments are, what the issues are, what the verses are, before you can even go from there. Okay, enough on that. Let's come tonight to second A and B, historical situation, and then we will get our application from it. See, I haven't forgotten about Gog and Magog and the Antichrist. See, I told you that it would come to that. So I'd be lying if we didn't get to it tonight. This is our last chance. I've only got, you know, 20 more minutes or something to do it in. <laughs> well, we don't need to laugh too much. This is a serious matter. Israel was special. I have some statements and thoughts here to give you to prepare you for what I want to say. Israel was special through God's divine election of her. God intended to use Israel, according to Genesis 12, to bless the world. Remember, he said that through you, Abraham, I'll bless the whole world. He intended that the world would receive light and life through the nation of Israel. Of course, we know historically that in actuality, it took Israel's apostasy for God to scatter them in the world so that he could begin fulfilling Genesis 12 and verse 3. And I know that's grandly fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but I think it's also been um, proleptically fulfilled and partially fulfilled in the diaspora, that God blessed the lives of many Gentile people through the light and the life that was given to the Jewish people in the synagogues. So God wants to bless the world. He's going to do it through Israel. And it's interesting that he can't do it with righteous, good Israel, because righteous, good Israel means Israel only in Palestine not outside of it. How could you bless the world then? And this is back to all the mysteries of the divine nature and sovereignty and will and plan of God, that in order for good to come, almost, evil had to come first. In order for God to bless Israel, he has to scatter Israel, or bless the world, he has to scatter Israel into the world as a seed sown for a great future harvest. And in order for God to justly scatter Israel into the world, she has to deserve it in the first place. So we're saying that in actuality it took Israel's apostasy for God to scatter her in the world and thus begin to fulfill Genesis 12, 3. Their role was to disseminate, disseminate his revelation wherever they went. And as a result of this, a worldwide messianic expectation blossomed. Now this is something I haven't touched on before. We're coming to A here. <coughs> As a result, a worldwide messianic expectation blossomed. Now, I bet you didn't even know this. So that even pagans in the centuries prior to Christ were expecting the first advent of the Messiah. Now, I'm going to prove this to you. Now, you see, we know, or maybe we don't. Hold on. Let me just back up for a moment. Uh, when we talk about the intertestamental period, we've looked at it historically. We've looked at it socially. We've looked at it religiously part way. See, we're just on the first of nine steps looking at it religiously, the period between the Testaments. A lot of um, uh, doctrines are being discussed. Um, let me think of the way to say it, because you can say it and you end up being like a liberal, and they say that you know all this is read back into the Old Testament, that the Old Testament knew nothing of these truths. But they're being discussed like they never were before, and I, I think that God does and did continue to work with his people. This is way back on the political tapes and political section in the period between the Testaments. Daniel 11 is your proof text for that. The people that do know their God will be strong and do exploits. And who were those people? The Maccabees, that can be proven from history. Uh, that spoke of the Maccabees, and it can have other references. Anyone who knows God will, do, will be strong and do exploits, but it spoke of the Maccabees. So God is still dealing with working through his people at that time. Do any of you know what were some of the doctrines that are characteristic, not of you know, pre-fall Israel, that is prior to 586 B.C., but so characteristic of the period between the Testaments? Got any guesses? What did they start talking about? Okay, messianic expectations begin to blossom like never before. What are some other things? Uh, no, not, not exactly. You, you might not have ever uh, known this or studied this before, okay? The doctrine of the bodily resurrection of the Jew. You see, the liberal says that's not in the Old Testament. Well, it's there, but it's difficult to find. Maybe in Psalms, maybe in Job, and of course definitely in, 
in uh, Daniel chapter 12, but Daniel 12 anyway was written about around 165 B.C., remember. So that doesn't help for Old Testament period according to the critics and the liberal scholars. What about demonology? Oh, certainly so. What about the next life? What about the word paradise? See, paradise is not an Old Testament term. That's an ITP term. And all of a sudden, you open the New Testament, and boom, Jesus talks to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43. Verily I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I was called up to the third heaven and heard in paradise. And you hear of paradise over in Revelation chapter 2 as well. That's an ITP term there, paradise. Uh, no, that's much later, the Kabbalah. Uh, oh, that's a great study, but that's way up into Middle Ages, the study of um, numistics or the study of numbers as far as the Jews are concerned. That's way late. But the study of demons, demonology, um, think of your books in the Apocrypha, the names of these new demons, Raphael, these new demons that are mentioned there, and the uh, new angels and everything that are covered there. Well, that's another topic that's brought up. Well, I wanted to say that. Uh, this would kind of be like number one. What were the Jews thinking? Well, they're certainly thinking messianically. Number two, what's the whole world thinking of? Well, as I said, messianic expectation has blossomed in the world because of the spread of the Jewish people, because of all the Jewish people's persecution. When the chips are down, you tend to look up. Messianic expectation has blossomed like never before. Believe it or not, such writers as these, Tacitus, uh, Virgil, Suetonius. For the continuation of this message, messianic expectation has blossomed like never before. Believe it or not, such writers as these, Tacitus, uh, Virgil, Suetonius, some of the secular historians and writers all spoke of, and they all spoke of it with the same word. I didn't bring all the references, but they all spoke of a blesser. Blesser, B-L-E-S-S-E-R, one who blesses. A blesser who would arrive one day in Judea. Now, a lot of people don't know this little historical truth here. I mean, I hope you can tell where I'm headed right down here with the application, our last application. That's where I'm headed tonight. The whole world was thinking of this. A lot of people don't know this. They just think, some people don't even know, some Christians don't even know that the Jews had an increase in messianic expectation during this time. But that just proves they haven't read the, the New Testament because, um, well, let's, let's start with that. Open your Bible with me real quickly, if you've got it with you tonight. Oh, <laughs> is that old statement? Uh, Luke, open your Bible with me to Luke. <clears throat> like Luke 1. What about this um, devout couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth? <clears throat> now, they have quite a role, you see, in God's plan to begin the end times. The end times begin with the ministry of Jesus on the earth, and they just become more and more the end times, the last of the last times, as time has rolled on. And so what do we have here? I mean, verse 17. God wouldn't have just picked Zechariah and Elizabeth just like out of a hat. We're already told in... Um, Verse 6, they were righteous before God, walking in all his commandments and ordinances, blameless. They were holy people, perhaps expecting the Messiah's advent. I don't think God would have chosen just uh, an old carnal rebel somewhere in Israel. And it doesn't matter what I think. Luke tells us in chapter 1 and verse 6, that's not true. God didn't just choose some old carnal rebel. He chose someone who was prepared. And so, of course, we've got the prophecy of the birth of their child, whose name is to be John. He shall go before, he, uh, let's start with 16. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. 
Now, you'd kind of think of, you know, Yahweh, the great God of the Old Testament, and he shall, he, John, shall go before him, him, that's the Lord God, whom we know to be Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, John he wasn't Elijah. He denied that in John chapter 1. They asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no, he ought to know who he was. He wasn't Elijah, but he came as a type of Elijah for the first advent, and the Elijah is going to come for the second advent according to Malachi 4, in the spirit. And so Luke tells us very specifically, this is not Elijah. Uh, this is one who has come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And a lot of people misinterpret what Jesus said whenever the disciples asked him about, well, what did the scribes say that Elijah must come? And Jesus said, well, truly he has come. And then some of the writer, the gospel writers say that they understood he was talking about John the Baptist. Well, you got to read that account carefully. You got two tenses there. Jesus says, first of all, Truly I say unto you, he shall come. And then the next verse will say, and if you could receive it, he was John the Baptist. In other words, he has come. Well, wait a minute, we got two tenses there. He shall surely come. That's the Elijah. We could call him the second one that will come at the second advent. And then, you see, it's, it's cryptic language there, and it, he means for it to be cryptic language. Then he said, if you could receive it, Elijah has already come. Well, he's not saying Elijah has come because Elijah didn't come. John came. His name wasn't Elijah or Elijah Jr. His name was John. So it's cryptic language. It has to be interpreted very carefully. And Luke 1, 17 happens to be one of the keys to interpret that. Here is what Jesus meant when he said Elijah has come in, in the form of John the Baptist. No, not really Elijah, but someone in the spirit and power of Elijah Amen. to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. That's the last verse in Malachi. Then he'll come to turn the children to the father and the fathers to the children, lest I smite the earth with a curse. Which says a lot. The last verse of the Old Testament in a prophecy of the second advent about divine order in the home. Parents and their children and children and parents of all things. The last verse, the last thing you can say, lest I smite the earth with a curse. That ought to be the last verse of Malachi 4. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord prepared for the Lord. We're looking first of all at this fact. The Jews during this period are expecting the first advent of the Messiah. Then if you flip over into chapter 2, verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ. Hallelujah. Now, what would you think if someone told you that the Lord had revealed that to them? Well, I know we'd all be quick to say no one knows the date or the hour. Well, I don't think that's what he claimed. I think he just said that it'd be in his lifetime. He didn't say he knew the date or the hour when the first advent would take place, just the Lord had revealed to him he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, I'm not claiming I've had that revelation, but I'm just saying, you know, people are so quick to, with their little uh, theological nonsense, explain things away. And they might not be ready or open to the Lord's Spirit when he's really trying to tell us something in the world today. But if they would have been living during this day, they never would have lived to participate in it, that's for sure. I mean... If God reveals something and we choose not to believe it, well, then we're not going to experience it then. And what's more than that, he wouldn't even reveal it to someone whom he knew would choose not to believe it. So the Jews are expecting. We could look at other verses. Paul speaks of all this under the uh, motif of the fullness of times in Galatians 4.4, 4, a phrase found only once in all of biblical writings, Galatians 4.4. 4. So let's then come to this second thing with Tacitus and Virgil. I, I'm claiming that the writings of history prove that even the secular pagan world was expecting a blesser. They didn't call him Messiah, uh, anointed, Mashiach, that's a Hebrew term. They were expecting a blesser to come in Judea. Now, you want biblical proof for that. Biblical proof that even the pagan world was expecting the first advent. Can you think of where it is? We got, we got a, almost a whole chapter. Well, let's, let's be honest, a half of a chapter. Matthew 2. What about those men that came from the east? 
I mean, come on, just some men over in Elam or Babylon or Assyria, and they see a star and they travel. Let's go over there, Matthew 2. What is this passage really all about? Now, it'll be read many times over these next few weeks. <laughs> but what is it really saying? The so-called Magi, M-A-G-I, although scholars have done a lot of fussing and fighting over that, whether you can really call these the Magi. Some translations even give them the Magi. But uh, oftentimes you just see them referred to as the wise men. <coughs> this would be verses 1 through 12. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. How would they even get the notion? I mean, I know, yes, it took supernatural revelation of them. But it's not like they're just pagans and God just burst this information upon them and they figure, okay, we'll go to Israel. They're already expecting it. Right in the Bible, a lot of people don't know this is here, not in this context. Right in the Bible, we have proof that the secular world in, in the Levant and in the Roman Empire was very conscious of the Jewish prophecies. And, and why and how were they conscious? Because of the diaspora. They were very conscious of this rising messianic expectation among the Jewish people. And as a result, they chose to adopt it and possess the same expectation themselves. Now, did you know that prior to your study tonight? Nope. That the Roman writers are quoting Jews and talking about a blesser that's going to come to Judea? That is just amazing. God purposely put Israel in all corners of the world so that a garden would be tilled for the seed of Christianity. You see, then when Paul comes teaching that all the Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled, Messiah, blesser, whatever you want to call him, he's God in the flesh, has come. Well, this made even more sense to people like the God-fearers then, who had already been birthed into an ethos that was expecting something like this. They had heard not only weekly in the synagogues the scriptures which made them anticipate the coming of this Messiah, but they had been birthed in an ethos that had embraced the same philosophy. Let me give you another point of reference here before we go on and make some application. Remember our study few months ago of those devout Jews in Acts 2, who were they? You know, Pentecost pilgrims or diaspora Jews? Well, we found out they weren't Pentecost pilgrims who've been out in the diaspora, who've come back to Jerusalem on, for the Feast of Pentecost to worship at the temple and then to go back home. No. What did we say? We proved earlier that these were diaspora Jews who late in life returned to Jerusalem to settle down. And I said that the reason for this move was so they could be on promised soil to die and to be buried. That meant a lot to them. They'd be in the promised land to die and to be buried. Now then I also said in that message that there's another reason they came back. And I said, we'll get to that in the future. And the future has arrived. There was another reason, and that reason was this. If possible, and we can determine this from the Jewish writings as to be a motive behind diaspora Jews coming back. If possible, they hoped to be in Israel when Messiah came. Can you believe all of this evidence here? In other words, you see, the first advent was not like a lot of people make it out to be, just, you know, totally off the wall, no one expecting it, just boom, it happened. And in like manner, the second advent, they say, no, you can't tell, people have always expected and you just don't know and, and don't trust anyone who tells you they have a suspicion that it might be near, have a feeling or an anointing and you can't ever tell. And that's the same attitude about the first advent. So what I'm saying as I lead into application here is let's interpret second advent in light of first advent here. That only makes sense to me. Let's interpret the second half of the story or the book in light of the first half. 
The first half tells us that not only among the people of God, Jews then, Christians now today, but in the whole pagan world, there was a great expectation of the Messianic inbreaking into history. And so some of the Jews are actually moving back to Palestine in hopes of the fact they'll be in Israel whenever Messiah comes on the scene. And of course, many of them were, and of course, a lot of them believed the religious leaders instead of Messiah when he came. And they didn't get the blessing until Pentecost, and they got the blessing then. Now, I want to read something that I came across not long ago just in my readings, and I had to stick it into my notes here. It was so utterly remarkable. It comes from an old line commentary, and it needs to be prefaced with this remark. It comes from the pen of, of um, well, this whole commentary set is rabidly amillennial. I mean, rabidly amillennial. They are not premillennialists by any stretch of the imagination. And here's what this writer has to say about the intertestamental period. Now, that's all he's describing. But, well, I'll let it speak for itself. The parallels between the intertestamental period and the 20th century AD are incredible. Gilbert Murray has characterized this period in history, ITP, as the failure of nerve. Nevertheless, this failure of nerve, which permeated all of life, was instrumental in producing a positive response to the glad tidings herald, heralded by the Christians in the first and second centuries. Now listen to some of these descriptions, political and socioeconomic descriptions. During this era, the average man was overcome. You, you would think he's writing in the 20th century. I was going to plan, I was going to read it, put all, you know, the verbs, present tense, and you'd know, well, yeah, someone wrote that probably last week talking about the 20th century. But I decided not to do it that way. During this era, the average man was overcome by the rapid advance of history and technology. Old systems, traditions, and loyalties were swept away. Remember, we've studied about the Roman government with their peace, with their law and order, with their communication system, with their systems of travel like never before. We're seeing the same type of ethos being formed in the crucible of history right now. The people rebelled against the tyranny of patriotism. The Greeks were cut loose from their allegiance to the city-state, and the citizens of Oriental land severed their connection with despotism. In Rome, ambitious leaders gathered a following and struggled for power. This led to civil wars. The state which once exploited the individual was now the object of exploitation. National patriotism, I mean, what this is, he's writing some, he, he doesn't mean to do this. I mean, he's not in any sense of the word trying to make a, a, a comparison between then and now. He's just describing then. But if you study European history, the, you know, people like um, um, uh, Bismarck, the German Iron Chancellor and so forth, and the unification in the 1870s of the Italian states. I mean, Italy wasn't even a country until the 1870s. The United States and its civil war, uh, you had a lot of independent, you know, little groups that didn't even make up countries. And a couple of world wars, of course, have rearranged topography and geography. National patriotism gave way to cosmopolitanism because of the influence of the Greek culture and Greek language. Everyone was subdued by that. And isn't it true today? Cosmopolitanism is the thing. You always hear about, you know, the Soviet teenagers that have adopted you know, American dress and American music and Americans who adopt, you know, Eastern religion and everyone is adopting something else from somebody else's country. Men became citizens of the world. The people lost faith. See, this doesn't sound like Harvey Cox's The Secular City in his newest book, Religion in the Secular City. The people lost faith in their ancestral gods. Individualism asserted itself in art, literature, politics, society, morality, and religion. Individualism. This was an age of change and upheaval. The changes brought with them a feeling of insecurity for the masses. It became increasingly difficult for them to adjust to this new order of life. Unemployment increased idleness in the cities, and the idleness in turn led to crime and immorality as a way of life. It's exactly what we're seeing happen right now, as, as I can't say as never before, but as never before since 
the period between the Testaments. When the inbreaking of the Greco-Roman culture and ethos totally swept away the world as it then was, the world prior to it. And the same thing is happening with the great spread of secular Westernism today. The world is not as it then was just a few hundred years ago. The whole world and the way people live and think and operate has been drastically changed. It went along the same way, you know, without a lot of change for many, many years, for many, many centuries, let's be, let's be honest and say. And now everything is being rearranged. My point is, to get to this application is, it applies today what we have seen happen here during earlier times in history. Just like in the first century B.C., the 20th century A.D., has witnessed an unprecedented rise in interest over such things as eschatology and biblical prophecy. Not only are the characteristics which I have just read the same across the board from ITP to the 20th century. Listen to me carefully now what I'm saying tonight. But an unprecedented rise in interest over eschatology and biblical prophecy. Now I hope that you have heard enough and been learning enough from the Christian ethics series of fundamentalism and biblical let with Darbyism and all of this to be able to put some of the pieces of the puzzle together in your mind. Whenever the Reformation came on the scene in the 1500s, early 1500s AD, there was no writing on eschatology. That was not the issue then. They adopted the eschatology of Roman Catholicism. And that pretty much stays the eschatology of the whole church until the beginning of the 1800s. And you've got new theories coming on the scene, such as post-millennialism with uh, Daniel Whitby's Bible and Notes, and pre-millennialism and pre-tribulationalism with John Nelson Darby and his Bible. If you've been reading George Marsden's Fundamentalism in American Culture, then you'll know some of these statistics here. The end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, the beginning of this century, an unprecedented rise in what were called prophecy in Bible conferences. People like um, Arno Gabelein, German immigrant to this country and one of the early founding fathers of premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, and the father of Frank Gabelein. Um, well, D.L. Moody, you know, people that traveled in, in that crowd, and some other names that, that we could mention. Uh, the Niagara Falls Bible and Prophecy Conferences, as I mentioned, Niagara Falls was a well-known uh, yearly set of um, conferences on biblical prophecy and eschatology. People just talking about it and talking about it and talking about it as never before. And no one can gainsay what I'm saying. All you have to do is study church history and eschatology was not an issue. It was justification. You know, it was church polity. Um, it was church tradition. It was, um, you know, something like that, but not eschatology and biblical prophecy. Now, a, a footnote of caution. Such curiosity has not been without its problems. But we know that first century B.C. curiosity over biblical prophecy was not without its problems. There was a huge rise, increase, in desires to study about prophecy, prophetic type things, biblical prophecies, Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so forth, first century B.C. I'm saying it was not without its problems. What did, what was the common conception of the Jews concerning Messiah? That there'd only be one advent, and that when he came, the time, the only time, the first time, the only time, it would be as a conquering Jewish king to subdue all of the Gentile powers which had subdued Israel through history. So I'm saying that there was the interest. The interest also involved some problems. Well, the same is true today. There's been a lot of interest in eschatology and biblical prophecy. Uh, all you have to do is turn on the radios or join one of the little prophecy clubs and you'll get, I've 
got some material where you get newspapers, you know, up-to-date newspapers. Anything that happens in the world, they'll interpret that for you in light of the Bible and show you this is what verse is being fulfilled. You know, that's all baloney. That can be proven to be false. But the interest in prophecy hasn't been problemless. But I think in the long run, as for the first century, so with the 20th, the interest will do more good than harm if in nothing else, simply in, as we have already seen before in the title of the message tonight, the awareness factor. Regardless of whether or not people can get all of the jots and the tittles connected and spelled out correctly about biblical prophecy, at least the whole world is interested in it right now. For instance, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, just to show you that first century B.C. A.D., interest in eschatology was not problemless, and so we shouldn't expect it to be any other than that today. This is after death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and his apostles are still a little confused on eschatology. And you see it in the classic text in Acts 1, 1 6, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You, they're still messed up on the advents. One, two, what time, what's the nature of the first advent? That's even after resurrection. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know the times that the Father's put in his own power, but you are going to be anointed with the Holy Spirit because there's business at hand. You can forget about the other thing. That's in the future. There's business at hand right now. We today have a where, an awareness of fact, a factor like never before. Take, for instance, the early 1970s, a publication of Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, which to date has sold over 10 million copies. Now, people have raked Lindsey over the coal, bless his heart, for his, he's kind of like C.I. Schofield's grandson, for his um, kind of simple, I'm not, I'm not going to call it that. I agree with a lot of, he's a dispensational pre-mill, pre-trib. I agree with a lot of what Lindsay has to say. But scholars don't like the popularization. They don't like someone taking their field of expertise and writing about it so people can understand it. You know, that seems to bother them. <laughs> Where people can understand it and get a blessing out of it, which is exactly what Lindsay has done. If you haven't read it, of course, it's a book that needs to be read, The Late Great Planet Earth, over 10, over 12. Let me revise it. Over 12 million copies sold today. Now, that's 12 million copies that people bought and read, and then how many of their friends have read it? What dissemination of biblical truth about eschatology and biblical prophecy in the world today? Praise God. Or you could take another less known book and not nearly as effective, Salem Kirbin's book, 666. I remember reading these books years ago. Uh, Salem Kirbin's book is probably one of the first books that I read. I still have it, I think. I know it's all falling apart like some of my Bibles, just all in shreds. He tells, if you've never read Salem Kirbin's book, it's kind of in um, um, story form about um, a family that got split because of the rapture and what happens to the person in the family that's left behind. So it's all, you know, a made-up story, a popularization of the thoughts and truths of biblical prophecy and eschatology. Now listen to this. Even the secular media in the Western world are familiar. Uh, media is a plural term. I know we all use it as a singular term, but we really shouldn't. I guess we can use it as lay people, but media... The media are, not the media is. The pronoun they substitutes for media, not it. The secular media are familiar. Did you not know that? Did you know that? Media is a plural term. We all say, well, the media is, or the media says. We can't say that. That's like saying um, all those people says. No, you have to say all those people say. You've got to have the verb that corresponds to the noun. The media say, not the media says. Well, that's free, unless you want to put something extra in the offering. Even the secular media are familiar with such terms and concepts as the following. Even the secular pagan media in the Western world are familiar with such terms and concepts as, now let's think of this and listen to these, Russia as the great bear, Gog and Magog, apocalyptic, 
No, people can't even pronounce the word, but you see that word right in the media, right in articles that have nothing to do with Bible or end times or anything. Just use the term apocalyptic. Rapture, second advent or second coming. You think of this, the whole of Western media, Western world, they are familiar with this. The tribulation period, the abomination of desolations, the Antichrist, Armageddon, and have I left anything out? Well, certainly, the number 666. Now, you explain to me what's the purpose or what's the origin, what's the reason behind, how can we explain this great awareness of biblical prophecy and eschatology in the 20th century unless, unless we're living right prior to the second advent of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even though the world might be all confused about it, at least there is the awareness factor out there. People like, you know, the Roman writers, they didn't end up getting saved just because they knew a blesser, was, a blesser was going to come in Judea, but at least they knew that he was going to come. And then down through history, we have not had this awareness. I'm sorry about these ignoramuses who tell us, well, people have always said we're living in the last days. I'm sorry about the fact that you're ignorant and you don't know history, but the facts of the matter are this has not been characteristic of history for the last 20 centuries. It is characteristic of the last couple of hundred years. Amen. A great awareness in the whole world, the Western educated civilized world, and then those people into whose contact they come of all of these apocalyptic, eschatological, book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Revelation terms that I've just given you here. You can pick up newspapers and they use terms like this, and they're not even writing about the Bible, and yet they're familiar with it. Gog and Magog, and they couldn't tell you what that meant if their life depended on it. But they know it's something about mysterious um, apocalyptic literature, or 666. I mean, everybody knows about that. You can almost, you could, you could, you ought to survey people and stop someone on the street and ask them, have you ever heard of Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon, or the number 666, or the Antichrist? It'd be interesting to find out who goes up and down with their head. I have heard of that the awareness factor. So just the awareness factor, if we can interpret ITP correctly and we can interpret our day and age in light of that, just the awareness factor, to me, in my opinion, seems to point toward the truth of Jesus Christ coming very soon. So here would be a point of advice as we wrap up here. If you can't convert other people to the truth, at least tell them about the end times. That's kind of Kerbin's um, philosophy, Salem Kerbin's philosophy in 666, because at least if then you are taken out in the rapture and they are here during the tribulation, they'll at least be aware of the fact this didn't just happen, this is predicted by a book. That book is the Bible, and I better turn my life around to that book and do something about my life, even though they're living right during the tribulation period. This message